Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. We'll be exploring the paranormal in psychotherapy today. My guest is Dr. Paul J. Leslie, a professor of psychology at Aiken College in Aiken, South Carolina, where he also has a private psychotherapy practice. Paul is the author of several books on psychotherapy, most recently Shadows in the Session, The Presence of the Anomalous in Psychotherapy. His other books include Low Country Shamanism, Potential Not Pathology, and The Art of Creating a Magical Session. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Great to be with you. It's a pleasure to be with you as well. This is the interview of the uh, five that we've done so far in your right. visit to Albuquerque that I've most been looking forward oh, to. Good. And good. in a way, I hope our viewers have seen the earlier ones because I regard them as preludes to actually <laughs> to, to this one. Right. Uh, I, I enjoyed every other one, but this is where my heart is. Oh, I understand. I understand. Yeah, yeah this is uh, not a... Um, an area that I thought I'd be writing about. So it, uh, it's been of an interesting journey, I mm. think, to, to kind of come this way to investigating those kind of, uh, anomalous things that can happen in the interactions mm. with, uh, therapists and clients. And I think it's fair to say, yeah, to characterize you as a mainstream psychotherapist. Uh, that's probably, I think it's adequate to say, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. I'm a little different. We all are, but I would say I'm pretty, uh, uh, pretty reliably mainstream in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, you you work in a conservative state. Yeah. Uh, you're uh, recognized by your peers in psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the points that you make is that your psychotherapy peers are very hesitant to talk about their paranormal experiences. Yeah. Uh, I think there's such a, um, uh, a fear of stigma if you mention that you had something strange, I mean really strange, happen uh, in, in a session with, with a client uh, to the point that when I was compiling this book and I wanted to have uh, stories uh, from therapists, I made sure that everybody's identity – uh, was, uh, changed so that they'd have some, some anonymity. Uh, for example, somebody in the United Kingdom, all I cited was they're from the United Kingdom. I mean, that mm. everything I could to allow them to feel comfortable that their story could be heard, but yet it wouldn't kind of go back to be a, a reflection on them. And I, I, I think it's kind of sad too. I, even if we may disagree on why weird things, anomalous things happen, uh, to just kind of ignore that they can happen and they don't happen all the time, but they can happen in some search, uh, situations, I think uh, isn't beneficial for the therapy too. Yeah. Well, I suppose part of it is because historically the uh, reports of anomalous experiences were considered a symptom of uh, psychosis. I would say historically and I think modern too. Mm -hmm. If you have someone who uh, tells you that they are seeing spirits in their home or they're, they're hearing voices that aren't there, uh, it is natural for all of us trained in the field. I mean, even with your background, when you saw clients, you had to make sure what's mm -hmm. magical thinking, uh, uh, a, a hallucinatory experience and what might be something else. And, uh, I think there's still that stigma, even though I found in my research that, uh, uh, the majority of people and many studies have found have, even if it's just one time, an auditory hallucination or a visual hallucination. So if the majority of people even just one time are having that, then, then this this whole idea that if that happens at all, that it's automatically a sign of uh, a mental illness, a psychopathology. I think that's that's a, a knee jerk reaction that. 
I was guilty of doing yeah. too. But uh, I think that that can sometimes harm our, our clients to, to automatically go in with the idea that if they're having these experiences, it has to be something uh, in, in a negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because a person uh, who is psychotic normally shows a whole range yes, yeah, of, of yeah. symptoms and is pretty easily identifiable. If a person is simply reporting paranormal experience and doesn't have many of the other symptoms associated with psychosis, it's probably more reasonable to suggest that they are uh, a normally functioning human being who's having a, a an anomalous or a paranormal experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering if down the road there could be a, if we have to diagnose, I'm, you know, I'm not big on diagnosing, yep. but if we have to, uh, grappling with anomalous experiences rather than making the client uh, or whoever's experiencing them, uh, the uh, kind of the, the source of everything in a negative light. So whether uh, we believe in something or not, if our client is exhibiting something, experiencing something, and everything else seems fine, I think sometimes we, we, we ought not rush into to judgment. And that's what's funny to me is the therapists who've had ex experiences happen within a session uh, tend to have their view of things slightly changed because now that they're having something weird happen, they can have a lot more empathy for people they talk to or just not be so dismissive of, of things they've heard. In fact, therapists are just as prone to have uh, anomalous or paranormal experiences as clients. Oh, oh, yes, absolutely. In their own personal life, something may happen. But again, it may be the kiss of death professionally uh, to to state that they you've had that. Because we're expected, I'm saying we as, as therapists are expected to be rational and scientific and in our field uh, as helpers uh, if we're talking about, you know, uh, having uh, ESP happen or things like that, our credibility, uh, it kind of shrinks down. But at the same time, if the majority of people, and study after study have shown this, at least half the population, and most studies say, have had these experiences. So why should our credibility naturally drop if, if one of us states that they've had something weird happen? But that's kind of the, the duality we're, we're operating in here. Well, there's been a tendency amongst the profession of psychology in general, not just psychotherapy, but academic and research psychology, to act as if the 150-year history of research into the paranormal, which was initiated by people like William James, the founder of modern American psychology, uh, to act as if th that literature doesn't exist. Right, yeah, and it's not there. And honestly, I didn't know much about it either. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only been fairly recently that I've uh, dug into it and, and found that, you know, th these things were being reported. And, and it, what's surprising to me is a lot of people don't know the, like, uh, when psychology came about, the first, I'm sorry, the second international congress on psychology, half of the panelists, uh, the presenters, were involved in psychical research. And uh, for the second and the third, I think by the time the fourth one, uh, fourth Congress came around, things had started to change. But th they were present, and these things were discussed. Um, and and some people credit psychical early psychical researchers like William James and many others as tightening up research protocols that psychology didn't have before. Mm -hmm. So we would just, I think, want to put on these blinders and say that that stuff never existed when there has been a history of discomfort with this phenomena happening, not just in general, but even in mm -hmm. therapy sessions. Yeah. Uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, even though publicly was a, uh, you know, he was a, uh, an atheist. He didn't want anything uh, involving weird occult uh, things coming into psychoanalysis because it was he felt that would would uh, undermine psychoanalysis as a science. But yet, privately, we find out he was very interested in ESP te telepathy experiments and psychoanalysis. What is known as uh, thought transference is is a jargon way to say. Telepathy, yep. you know, but he wanted to kind of disguise it because it was happening so much in the sessions that they came up with this, this, uh, uh almost a, a scientific sounding, uh, thing that he felt that had a, it had it rooted in materialistic 
but yet he could find no cause for it. He couldn't hide uh, that it was happening, so he kind of rebranded it mm-hmm. so it would be easier for some of his uh, his disciples uh, to take. As a matter of fact, I found out that Sigmund Freud was a member of the Society for Psychical Research. I never learned that in my undergraduate or graduate classes about Freud. And he had a uh, series of experiments he did with uh, Anna, his daughter, and uh, Sandor Ferenczi in um, Hungary. They interacted about experiments, but Freud was always keep it quiet. Mm -hmm. So he was publicly saying one thing, but privately uh, doing something else. Well, um, there's a lot to be said about the history of great psychologists Mm -hmm. interested in in this field, but I'd like to move into an experience that you very bravely reported about uh, about yourself Mm -hmm. in a psychotherapy session. Bravely, I don't know, maybe (laughs) foolhardily. But in any case, it's a real yeah. experience. Yeah. You really had this experience. I did. And I still uh, feel uncomfortable talking about it. I'm going to, but uh, it's still I have the back of my uh, mind going like, everyone's going to think you're a little bizarre. And they may. But, mm-hmm. you know, it is what it is. Uh, I had this client who I had seen. Where I'm going to call her Janet. And I'd been seeing Janet for probably close to two years. Now, I'm usually a fairly brief therapist. I come from the strategic line where you try to get people uh, well as quick as possible and move on with their life. So this was a, a longer term client I had. And she was um, suffering from uh, uh, bipolar disorder, bipolar one. And it's a, it's a very debilitating uh, disorder. And uh, she was in that partner life. She, uh, she didn't have money. She could barely afford the, the sessions. Uh, I even did some pro bono work to help her, trying to get found a way for her to get medication to kind of help with her symptoms. So she's bravely fighting against this. I really liked her as a person. I thought she was, she was, I admired her greatly. So I look forward to our sessions. And, uh, one day, uh, in a session, we were, uh, sitting as, as you and I are, and she was relating to me about, um, she's kind of beating herself up because she had this bipolar and she felt she was a embarrassment to her family because all, you know, the symptoms that go along with it. And she got really uh, emotionally uh, upset because uh, her father had died uh, a couple of years back and that he never got to see her, that she was getting better. And and he missed her. Uh, she missed him rather greatly. And so I decided, since we never really talked about her father, I was going to, let, let's discuss those feelings. So I had a chair right mm-hmm. beside me, an empty chair. And um, I was going to use a technique that I learned from Gestalt therapy. Uh, we'll just call it the empty chair technique, where if someone's not present uh, and maybe even they've passed away, we can have an imaginal dialogue so they can get some of the emotion out and maybe have some resolution. So I said, uh, Janet, let's just... What if your father was sitting right here in this chair right now? And as I was saying that, I'm just going to say it felt, and it, it's a felt sense. This I is can't, your deceased father. Yeah, deceased father. It felt like somebody sat down in the chair. I mean, I, just, I don't know how to explain that. So first of all, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real linear, sometimes thinker, maybe too linear, and left brain. So I thought initially, I was feeling weird, and I thought, well, maybe I'm being a little overdramatic in my mm-hmm. presentation. And, and I, I just, I'm talking to, to Janet about her father's in the chair, and then all of a sudden, I have this um, I'm trying to find words to adequately express uh, the sensory experience that I'm, I'm starting to cry and I don't know why. And I get this image and this has never happened to me previously and hasn't happened since, thankfully, of uh, <clears throat> an ice cream uh, called a push up, like an orange sherbet. And you push it up and you, you know, kids, kids love that. And then I saw like a body of water. And I'm wondering what that's about. And I hear myself say, I just said, what if your father was sitting in this chair? And I said, does a push-up ice cream and your father mean anything to you? And Janet went, oh, my God. 
we used to go to the lake. Yeah. And she said, after we go to the lake, we'd put the, the push up. I'd, I'd get push ups. He'd buy it for me. I'd pretend they were lipstick and he'd laugh and I'd laugh. It's, it's one of the things I, I cherish a memory I had. And then I'm just, tears are just streaming. Janet's never really saw me cry. I don't usually do that. And she's, what's going on? And I, I just hear myself saying, your father wants me to tell you he loves you. And I find myself standing up. And she intuitively stands up, I guess, instinctively, and I and I put my arms around her, and we embraced. And I don't know why. It's like somebody was. It sounds strange, but somebody was mm-hmm. like moving me to do that, not forcing me, but kind of moving me. And uh, we embraced. It was only like maybe a, you know thirty seconds or so. It felt like a long time. And then it's like. Everything was clear, and I, I kind of, it's almost like coming out of a trance, if you will. I'm just, and, and so we sit down, and she's like, are you clairvoyant? I don't even remember what I told her, because I'm trying to figure out what it is. Somehow we got through the session, and uh, we uh, never, in our therapy work, we never spoke of it again. And uh, I've been, if you'll pardon the pun, I've been haunted by that, uh, and this a couple of years back, over time, I, I've just been trying to make sense of that, and that's what I think led me to see if other therapists had had experiences. And initially, I, I, I went to the literature, and I didn't find much in the literature. There are some things about clients who have strange, uh, anomalous experiences, but not really about um, a psychotherapist having that with the client. So it, it kind of put me on a path that I didn't expect to go down when, when writing this latest book. It, it has been troubling. I, I'll be honest with you. It's been very uh, troubling and very difficult for me to get the, uh, use the term courage, the courage to bravery up to actually mm-hmm. write about that. But I felt if maybe by me giving my story, mm-hmm. we can create a dialogue and maybe other people who may be haunted as well can can feel better. But it's not as if the uh, experience stayed with you that you became possessed or anything thereafter. No, it no. came and it went and it was healing. It, it was. You know, it's funny. As, as I was finishing up the book, I ran in. I hadn't seen her in a while. Ran into Janet. Mm. And I, I asked her, I said, do you remember? I said, I want to ask you about something. Do you remember the time... That And before I even could finish it, she knew what I was talking about. And she said it had been very, very healing for her. And she says, and sometimes I wonder if you were just making it up, because I know you do crazy things to help people change, because she apparently went and read my other books, you know. <laughs> but uh, she said at the end it didn't matter. And, and I saw her on like a Monday or Tuesday, and that Sunday had been Father's Day, a day that was usually sad for her. Yeah. But she said since that time it, she'd been able to maybe process it mm-hmm. a little better. So it was, it was healing for, uh, for Janet, confusing for me. But uh, I'm glad something good uh, came out of it. And my sense is, yes, people talk about the paranormal as if it were scary, but 99% of the experiences that I hear about uh, are of this nature. They're positive. They're beneficial. Uh, there's nothing uh, scary or spooky right. uh, about them at all. Mm-hmm. I think of them as natural. Well, that's the thing. What's normal? What's paranormal? It's, mm-hmm. you know, who's, re- that comes down to who's, uh, who's making the distinction sometimes. Yeah. If half the population are having these experiences, who's, who, who's, uh, in charge of the narrative, yeah. uh, here? Uh, for me, uh, it, it was initially troubling mm. to the point that I remember like the next day, I call up the most trusted person on the planet, my mom. You know, moms have a great way, a good mom, which I have a great mom, of, uh, of helping us out. And I remember talking to my mom and, and telling her, I said, I'm going to tell you this. I, I think, I, I don't know if I'm going crazy. And every other sentence, I was trying, no, I'm not crazy, mom, but, it, <laughs> now, and, and I remember her kind of chuckling at me. She says something like, you know, son, I, I've known you your entire life. I know how much common sense you have. You can quit saying, <laughs> you know, those, those kind of things. And, uh, uh, in, in the, the conversation, uh, I found out that, um, you know, I've had, uh, relatives 
uh, that had had uh, were, were supposed, which I didn't know, were supposed to be psychic. And I'm not claiming to be psychic. And I want everyone to know I don't don't come to me to get connected with your deceased loved ones. I, I, I that's not, I don't do that, you know. But to have these so-called psychic abilities, and I thought, well, maybe there's more to this in the general population. I mm-hmm. ended up talking to a colleague I I trust very much who kind of told me, number one, Paul, you're not crazy. Number two, I've had a a similar but different experience. And I think that's what started the ball rolling. And it's almost like we were giving each other permission then to share and kind of release that that angst Mm -hmm. of, of the unknown. Well, I suspect psychotherapists may be more reluctant to talk about these kinds of experiences than just members of the general population. I think so. Uh, we also have to look at the the culture these days. We have all so many uh, television programs now. I mean, mm-hmm. I was at a conference this past week, and I was turning on a, a channel uh, TV channel and every other show was about something that we would call paranormal, mm-hmm. uh, you know, ghost shows, psychic shows and all that. So yeah. if that's out in our culture, yeah. uh, much in the way that the spiritualist movement, uh, you know, uh, was going on, it shapes the culture a little bit. Mm-hmm. So people who may or may not be having paranormal experiences may kind of feel like that may be what's happening due to the information Mm -hmm. that they're they're getting and i think we as therapists instead of outright dismissing that because the research shows clients want to talk about these things but they're absolutely hesitant why because we think we're going to label them as crazy or or we're going to try to uh, you know put them on some kind of medication that they don't need or or something like that but they want to talk about that so if we can create a space where that dialogue can happen Maybe like in the case of my client, that could be a healing experience. Mm -hmm. Well, and in your research here, you found, yes, therapists are very reluctant to talk about it. But at the end of the day, a number of them told you, and in fact, some of the experiences were more dramatic than your own. Yeah. Oh, yes. There's uh, uh, many that were incredibly dramatic. Uh, The, excuse me, the. A uh, big thing I'm seeing is, and I found a research study that's, that asked, was over in the UK, asking, you know, do you deal with these things? And most every therapist said that they felt they needed more training to deal with these things. Because if clients are reporting this, how do we work with them? But now, nothing's done about what happens when it's in your session. Uh, I remember talking to one gentleman who is, uh, if you think I'm I'm real left brain, this guy, he was originally going to be an engineer, mm-hmm. but he wanted to help people, so he went into psychology, clinical psychology. And he chose his theory and uh, of how to work with people based on the evidence. So it's very mm-hmm. evidence-based. So he's a very, um, and if he's, if you're listening, sorry, rigid kind of uh, <laughs> uh, person, uh, but nice person. Uh, he had an experience talking to a young a uh, woman who missed, talking about missing people, missed her mother. Mm. And I think this young woman was going through a time period, and it sure would be nice if my mom was around. And she became very upset. And as a lot of times we do, we give them a space just to to emote. And we don't need to say anything. We just need a safe place to do that. And he said, and as I'm you know, watching her and giving her space, he says, it's almost like a shadow like a, a a shape, dark shape kind of manifests behind her. And he says, so the light's on. It's some, some kind of, is it my eyes? And it's almost like this this outline, and it looked like like arms would come out onto her, uh, the, the, the client's shoulders, and then would kind of disappear. And it kind of came back, and he's, he's, he's sitting here going, am, am I... Am I seeing this? He's trying not to interrupt that. And he's like, am I seeing what I'm seeing? This doesn't fit what's going on. Is it the lighting? And he said, I start to get this weird feeling about, and, and uh, finally the thing goes away. She, After it's touching her, she seems to let out mm-hmm. all the, and, and he says, of course, I never said anything to her. After she left, uh, you know, he's trying to figure out what's you know, going on. And he said, it has really bothered me because I can't trust what I see. 
because he's already bought into the you know the the, the world is all what we can mm-hmm. touch and yep. so if there's another thing going on uh, that, that he can't accept that but yet something profound happened I mean and that was even more profound to mm-hmm. you know seeing things um, and he, he said I have yet to see anything like that and I think it's a natural human tendency uh, whether you're a materialist or hold a, to any other orthodox belief if you have a, an experience that's anomalous in the context of your belief system you're going to put it out of your mind yes yeah so many people who say, oh, I've never had that kind of an experience, it's because you forgot about it right away. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or just went to an explanation that felt yeah. comfortable because mm-hmm. we don't want to feel uncomfortable. Sure. So, you know, hypothetically, if uh, something manifests uh, in front of you as in, you know, it, it looks like your grandfather, you will say, you know, I must have been in a hypnagogic, you know, coming out of a, a sleep mm-hmm. or something. And, and that may be true. Yeah. But it's it's more comforting to think that's you know well, what a it was. Well, hypnagogic experience isn't less valid. Oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah in, 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 in fact, Carl Jung worked extensively yeah. in the hypnagogic state, as, as did many other great mystics. Yeah, and uh, uh, Jung particularly got a lot of information about uh, things that helped his work expand mm-hmm. and, and grow to help more people. Well, there's a history of. Some of the great psychotherapists who seem to have a talent in the psychic realm themselves. Mm -hmm. We talked earlier about Milton Erickson, for example, who is highly intuitive, did Mm -hmm. things that other people thought were crazy, and yet they worked beautifully. Yeah, absolutely. It's, and, and just, and a lot of times couldn't tell you, even though he was not. Uh, what I call spiritual or into anomalous things, but he never could really articulate how he did some of these yeah. things or knew some of these things. Some of it he could, some of it he couldn't. Um, I, I think the, the whole issue uh, from the therapist's perspective is if we welcome and are comfortable with the unknown, mm-hmm. um, we give that place for the client to heal. We, we don't like the unknown. We, we want to put up as therapists, we want to say, oh, we, we go into the unknown world of the client, but we want easy explanation. So if you were to come in and say, I'm, I'm having depression, oh, I have an easy explanation. It's your cognitive distortions. Your thinking needs to be tweaked. You have irrational thoughts that's making you depressed. Or here's a medication. I have an answer, right? Or let's do some yoga or mindfulness. When it gets to be something that we can't explain, the therapists get real worried. We're always looking for explanatory models. Mm-hmm. And when we don't have one, it's, it's easier to kind of deny mm-hmm. that something's happening. And I'm, you know, initially I was kind of guilty of that too. Well, you've also encountered individuals who come into the field of psychotherapy already with a uh, pronounced spiritual or psychic gift. Right. In, in my book, I intentionally did not talk to those people because I wanted to reflect that this, you don't have to be that way for this to occasionally happen. Mm-hmm. And if someone's never been in psychotherapy, I'd say, you know, this is not the usual thing. This is a very rare thing that happens. But uh, I have a, a colleague in particular who uh, has recently uh, come out, shall we say, uh, to say she's a psychic, a practicing psychic, and has been doing intuitive work for many years. And she's kind of kept that quiet because her main occupation was as a as a psychotherapist yeah. and she did not want to have those cross over where the client never knew that she was always pulling from her intuition mm. you know what her gut said and we could uh, she would say it's her psychic ability uh so i think we're seeing a, a shift in maybe people's openness to kind of go down it's that a route. small shift because i I'm pretty sure that uh, some therapists would feel, and maybe with justification, that if they're too open about it, they might lose their license. Oh, I think there's there's some uh, truth to that. Uh, I think we also need to, you know, um, be clear that uh, being a psychic is not being a therapist. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a fear that if if there's that distinction between the two, if we blur that too much then uh, that may be not beneficial to the client. Mm-hmm. Or at the same time, it also takes away from the specialness of each 
particular area. Where is as as we discussed in a previous interview, if we're part of a healing tradition, you know, the the healers of old, they didn't have these kind of parameters. They just did what they did, you know. Well, I'm sure as a psychotherapist you can appreciate that uh, one of the risks of being psychic is what um the Jungians have called ego inflation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I would think, and, and I'm not psychic, but I would think that someone who has that, uh, if, if it's not in check, like the lady that I was just uh, mentioning, my, my colleague and friend, uh, she's very grounded and all, but it's real easy for that to, you become then what I call the uh, the wizard or, you know, the, the Svengali almost, mm-hmm. where you have not only the, the, the tools of, of psychotherapy, but if you are, if, if such thing exists of psychic ability, it's almost, it's real easy to go from uh, a, a therapist to a cult leader <laughs> real quick yeah. in that kind of scenario. And I have actually known and even interviewed a couple of very talented therapists who lost their license. Mm-hmm. And I'm inclined to think that it wasn't because they were psychic or doing bringing psychic things into the therapy session. It was more about the ego inflation yeah. where they began directing their clients to do certain things that you know were maybe cross boundaries, but they felt that because of who they were and their gifts that this right. was okay. Right, yeah. It's when we start to believe in any uh type of psychotherapy that we always know better than our client, that's a tricky place to be, and mm-hmm. we, we need to check that. And then when you add any kind of psychic ability, uh, I could see how you got to double check that, because we all think we know what the person needs. I mean, we almost, oh, here's your problem, I'm going to tell you what to do, and go do this, and uh, and, and maybe that helps them. But uh, it, it is, it's a very slippery mm-hmm. slope, I think. Yeah. Now, you cite a number of well-known therapists uh, in, in your book. One of them, whom I knew, was Jewel Eisenbud. Oh, yeah. yeah. Who, who did extensive research on some of the most extraordinary yeah, uh, paranormal phenomenon, the psychic photography of, yes, yeah. of Ted Sirios. But he also wrote a book called Parapsychology and the Unconscious. Right. And, and he warned that uh, if a person has... A, even a normal neurosis, but and they have a psychic gift. It's possible that the psychic gift can work in the service of of a neurotic impulse, a self destructive neurotic impulse, even. Mm-hmm. And it, he was operating through that that Freudian uh, perspective. Yeah. Um, his ideas uh, uh, very intriguing on many levels. Uh, he was not very, uh, his ideas were not very uh, appreciated. I, I even remember we're talking about licenses and things like yeah. that. His position with, I think, it was the New York Psychoanalytic Society, I think, might have been uh, threatened because of the, the research he was doing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, but yet, the, those, those are important conversations uh, to have. And if uh, someone comes and they've had a history of trauma and are disassociating, uh, you know, that's their coping mechanism. It's not uncommon that people who have that and disassociation may have access to unconscious cues and things that the rest of us don't. And it may appear psychic or it could be genuine psychic phenomena. Mm-hmm. So um, th- these are the, the, the things I, I would like to see much more research mm-hmm. on. I mean, it would help us help our yeah. clients more. Well, one, one of the findings that I'm aware of, which I think is very relevant to the field of psychotherapy, is that amongst the people who report um, more than the normal amount of subjective psychic experiences, a high percentage of them also report uh, some sort of emotional or physical abuse in their childhood. Right, right. There seems to be a correlation. And, and to me... It's because those people uh, retreat into an inner world to escape from something terrifying in their outer world. And when they do that, they they can open up uh, doorways to psychic experience. Uh, There's uh, uh, theories of of boundaries. I I can't remember his first name. His last name's Hartman. It'll come to me. Uh, Hartman, who uh, felt a lot of personality is based on our boundaries, our, our, our... 
psychological barriers between us and other mm-hmm. people. And he found that people who uh, tended to be more creative and artistic had these thinner boundaries. Mm-hmm. And those who tend to be more like an engineer and, and more uh, uh, pragmatic tend to have uh, thicker yep. uh, boundaries. So I wonder if, and again, I'm just, this is a conjecture on my part, people who already have those thinner boundaries mm-hmm. and he's, are, they're intuitive, they, they you know the emotion, when those particular people have to go through traumatic things, it, it's almost like the, the, the boundaries become even more uh, uh, thin. And that's the the idea that the brain, if it's a filter and, and the keeping information out, when that becomes thinner, the information comes in almost like there's a grid that surrounds mm-hmm. all of us. Um, I, it's really hard to to know because it's not something that, at least at this stage, that we can measure when a client comes in where their, you know, the, their uh, intrapsychic uh, boundaries are. But to me, that's something that we need to be aware of, particularly with traumatized people, because if we're working with them and they suddenly start reporting these psychic phenomena, rather than thinking it's a pathology, thinking, well, is this due to the trauma that those boundaries mm-hmm. might have become a little more thin yeah. and it may be a natural occurring thing. Yeah, Gene Houston, who has been a big inspiration to me, sometimes refers to it as leaky margins. Yeah, that, that's that's it. You know, I'm thinking, as you just said that, what popped in my head was that in that moment with my client, Janet, she had a leaky margin. And this is something, oh my gosh, this just... It just popped in my head. I had a leaky margin, too. Yes. Yeah. I was going through, at that time, I was going through a divorce, a hard time. And if emotions and things like that, I, I don't know why I didn't even think about this. Okay. I have to rewrite the book now, Jeff. Thanks. But, but I had that, too. And maybe because we were both there due to mm-hmm. the emotional state, yep. that that part of our brain, the, 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 the prefrontal cortex, the real thinking part, kind of moved a little bit. Maybe that filter shift a little bit, and maybe somehow I picked up cues that I, I might mm-hmm. not have picked up otherwise. That, that sounds good. We'll, we may run with it for the moment, but that, that may have been it. Maybe it's because when people in such deep rapport and those mirror neurons are firing off and mm-hmm. there's such resonance that those we always talk about the emotional barrier drops, but maybe the the, the psychic barrier yeah. may drop too. I, and I know you report that many psychoanalysts began to talk about transference and counter-transference involving what uh, the old psychical researchers called thought transference. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, it, it, it is funny to me, going back now with the eyes that I have, mm-hmm. and seeing how many of these people privately had this and and how hard they worked to to keep it quiet. I read this wonderful paper in a, 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 about Robert Stoller, who's a very well respected uh, psychoanalyst. I think he taught at UCLA at one time, and he once wrote a paper all about the 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 dreams he was having with clients and back and forth, and they were having these psychical imagery. He'd have something in his life happen the day before, and his client would show up, Doc, I've had this dream, Mm -hmm. and it almost matches what he went through the day before. Mm -hmm. And so he took that paper, and he sent it to a colleague, and his colleague's like, Robert, are you crazy? Your career's over. So he put it in a drawer. And years after he died... Uh, uh, one of his uh, uh, students, I think, found it, and and they ended up releasing it. And you see all this stuff that was happening. Mm-hmm. That I wonder how many other uh, well-known and and not so well-known therapists who are really in those emotional attached, uh, or it's not attached to me, emotional interactive mm-hmm. type of working. Uh, it may occur. I'm wondering if it is. It has to be a really in-depth, long-term. Uh, for that to happen more often, maybe because the, the barriers then it, it, it drops because we're more comfortable uh, with each other. Well, that can be, but as you point out in, in your work in brief therapy, mm-hmm. magic can happen in an at instant. Any time, <laughs> at any time, yeah, at the least, when we least suspect it. Yeah. Well, if I knew that was going to happen, I might have canceled the appointment that day because it's just... Uh, Good luck. <laughs> yeah, I, well, it'll, it'll find you one way or another. That's well, one I reason I'm creating this uh, video archive now of hundreds of videos is because almost every situation that might come up in a therapy session where therapists are going to say, gee, I'm crazy, I can't talk 
talk about it. There's research literature on, for example, mutual dreaming. Right, right, exactly. And uh, I, I think we, t- when we started moving uh, in the uh, 1950s to the cognitive therapies and the behavioral therapies, everything became conscious. The focus is on our conscious mind. Mm-hmm. And I find that a lot of the psychotherapies that have a consideration of the unconscious, subconscious, however people call it, it seems to be it may show up more often. Uh, and, but not saying that it won't show up, you know, somebody who's a cognitive behavioral mm-hmm. therapist. But um, it's something about that hidden realm of the unconscious, maybe just the, the act of welcoming yeah. in that, that uh, relational field that, that, that may show up more often. Uh, probably so. And, and, of course, some of the, like Albert Ellis, a man I'm very fond of yeah. uh, and have had the privilege of interviewing uh, along with his wife, Debbie. Right. But he used to, when you talk about the paranormal with him, he'd just say bullshit. Yeah, yeah. And, and that... You know, a word like that can have a, a, a subconscious impact on people. You don't want to talk about about it if Albert Ellis thinks it's bullshit. Oh, yeah. And and in that position, and and let, he he's one of the greats of the 20th century psychotherapy. And um, there there was a time when if if Albert uh, if Al Ellis said uh, said uh, bullshit, I would have said. Right on, brother. <laughs> and now it's kind of like, well, but we're also shutting down the dialogue. Yeah. So even if I am right on, I agree it's BS. Um, if I'm taking that with my uh, client and my client really believes that, I'm ending the rapport that we have. Mm-hmm. I'm shutting down a possible avenue uh, that we could explore that might be related to the reason they're coming in. Yeah. It, they again that clients want to talk about strange things they want to talk about their religious beliefs uh when when we take such a dogmatic view within the session uh, i i think it costs us dearly i really do and, and you know albert ellis uh it was a great psychotherapist and Absolutely. a deep student of philosophy, but there are other great thinkers like Plato yeah, who, yeah, yeah. who would take issue with him. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, he, Plato would uh, – a little bit I've read of Plato. It, it's interesting how the, the rudimentary understanding of Plato that you get it, like an undergrad, when mm-hmm. you read deeper, I mean, this is a profoundly – everything was a profoundly spiritual uh, writing that he was doing, and 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 it borders on your ear. Is this the great philosopher? Because you know philosophy is so uh, the way it's presented. Uh, it's it's supposed to be almost uh, about what we can see and touch and feel mm, and then rational. You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and um, yeah, it's but those guys. Uh, not to not to shift the topic here, but those guys like Plato, the the the, the, the feet in both camps. That there was no, there, there's a flow there. They could kind of operate mm-hmm. and move in worlds, and we are in such a dichotomous yeah. world, particularly in therapy. Of you know, we don't talk about these. Things. This we talk about. Mm-hmm. But I think if you're going to do therapy, everything has to be open, difficult conversation. We're trained to have difficult conversations, but it's kind of like difficult conversations as long as it's not that. Yeah. And like I say, that that can be detrimental to the yeah, session. I think it's quite possible. I think what th- this video channel is about is that you can be rational and scientific and mystical at the same mm-hmm. time. And there are many historical examples and contemporary examples. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, and I, you're one of them. Well, well <laughs> I, I'm an unwilling participant, but I'm participating nonetheless. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just uh, again, I just hope that uh, by uh, sharing my story, uh, the other stories I've shared, that we don't have to lose our scientific rigor. And, and we can say, if nothing else, let's take the view that when we make a space uh, for this, uh, people can heal. I, I give you a real quick story. I, and I talk about this in the book. I had uh, somebody I knew who's uh, she was going through a divorce and her uh, daughter, who was a teenager, was having you know, uh, some strange experiences and uh, had some depression and all because, you know, her mom and dad are splitting up. So um, they asked me to send them some, you know, a referral. And I, I did, someone who I'd heard good things about. Well, a couple of sessions later, the mom calls me and said, uh, Paul, I'm, I'm kind of upset. This uh, 
professional has said that my daughter's uh, not well and probably needs medication. I said, well, uh, tell me about that. Well, the daughter ended up telling the therapist that every now and then weird things happen in the house, and sometimes she's scared to be alone. Lights will come on and off. Little things will shift in the house, kind of weird sensations. Mm -hmm. And the therapist uh, kind of felt that, and, and said to her, if we keep experiencing these paranormal things, we may have to seek medication and talk mm -hmm. to the mom about that. Well, the mom told me I was so offended because I have those same experiences. Mm -hmm. I said, whoa, whoa, you guys are both experiencing this? And she said, yes. And, I, and she says, I don't know what to do. Uh, you know, we're, we've, we've grown apart through this whole thing. She's depressed. And so I thought, I said, well, let me call you back. And, and I called her back and I said, um, here's what I'd like you to do. I talked with an expert in this kind of stuff, which meant secretly, Paul went to the internet and looked, <laughs> right? And I find that I don't know if you really do have a bad spirit in your house, but maybe you need to do a house cleansing. So I told him that they had to take a white candle and go through each room and say, they're religious, and say a prayer, hold hands, say a prayer, and then say what each a memory or two good that they had in each room mm -hmm. to each other. And it's a big house, and they went through it all, and they reported back to me and said, we think the house is, is clear now. We, we don't have that. I don't know if the house was haunted. What I do know, by using their belief system, I was able to bring them together mm -hmm. indirectly to share and to connect. And the mom ended up telling me later they had grown some reason they were getting along better. They were, felt connected. So if I had done an Albert at BS and put that <laughs> kid on the meds, uh, you know, not only to the to the child's health, to yeah. getting medication for something that they might not need it, missing a wonderful opportunity mm -hmm. to use the client's belief system to create change in that family dynamic. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if they had looked into the literature, they might know that there are actually hundreds of such cases mm -hmm. that have been reported under credible conditions, right, and right. that in many, but not all of those cases, uh, a simple little ritual like that can be quite effective. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it, and we don't have, and just say this, we don't have to always believe yeah. in that. What's the client? How, well, how does it help the client? Mm -hmm. And if it's not unethical... Why not? It doesn't hurt to enter into the client's worldview. In fact, it's highly recommended Absolutely. in many schools of therapy. Indeed, indeed, uh -huh. yeah. Well, Paul Leslie, once again, a very heartfelt and profound conversation. I'm so delighted that you made the journey to Albuquerque to share this with me. Not as delighted as I am. Thank you. I appreciate all you do. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.